everyone. Thank you for coming to our third plenary, uh, which is Sean Hoban. And his travel here was sponsored by the Washington State Department of Natural Resources. And if you haven't heard of Sean, that's surprising because he does have over 80 publications. And he is currently the tree conservation biologist at the Morton Arboretum in Chicago. But he also has a leading role in GeoBon, which is the IUCN Conservation Genetic Specialist Group and the Coalition for Conservation Genetics. What he is currently focusing on is doing science-based evidence for developing exit to collections, as well as working on incorporating knowledge on adaptive capacity into international and global policy, which in your talk you will see, in his talk you will see uh, does not necessarily need genetic data. And so without further ado, I'll hand it over to Sean. Thank you, Haley, for the introduction. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me, and thank you all for coming today. I will be talking about how we can conserve genetic diversity without actually having any genetic data for the focal species. And I'll be talking on behalf of numerous great collaborators that I've worked with, including Linda Lycra, Emily Beckman Bruns, uh, Kaylee Rosenberger, and many collaborators through the Coalition for Conservation Genetics. I want to acknowledge that the Morton Arboretum is located on the ancestral homelands of the, three the Council of the Three Fires and many other tribes that resided on or migrated through the area through time. And I acknowledge and respect the traditional caretakers of the land and their ways of knowing. I'm here as a lover of trees. I've always been fascinated with their beauty, their longevity, their ability to dominate and create environments, their physiological and biochemical and physical adaptations to the environment. I'm here as a conservationist. About 30% of all known tree species are threatened with imminent extinction. Due to causes that we know well, including uh, invasive pests and pathogens, destruction of forest, uh, primarily for agriculture, harvest of high value trees, for their timber and non-timber products, and the ongoing threat of climate change. And I'm here as a representative of the Botanic Garden community, a community which has a unique combination of skills and resources which are complementary to those in academia, industry, uh, and government research. So Botanic Gardens are an important part of conservation solutions. We also have a really large impact in terms of outreach to the public. Over hundreds of millions of people visit Botanic Gardens per year. And so we are committed to solving global challenges like food security and biodiversity loss. My lab at the Morton Arboretum, we have a lab mission, which is to develop the knowledge and tools to guide conservation action and help species not only survive, but thrive during an era of change, focused especially on maintaining evolutionary resilience. I am based at the Morton Arboretum, but I also uh, mentor PhD students through the University of Chicago. I'm going to start my talk by uh, explaining um, my skepticism about the role of genetic data in conservation and policy. In a groundbreaking study in 2016, Jenny Pearson uh, analyzed management reports of threatened species and showed that in many cases, genetic concerns, genetic issues are not mentioned in the management of threatened species, and that for the vast majority of species, we have very little data on, um, on our, even our most high priority, high funded, high research threatened species. Myself and Dr. Linda Lycra, 10 years apart, have analyzed national and global policy documents to see how much genetic content is in these documents. And the, the, the short answer is very little. Um, in, in these uh, documents for the Convention on Biological Diversity, there's very little mention of genetic studies, of genetic issues. And when it is mentioned, it's mostly mentioned for agricultural species. When policymakers talk about the genetic status of species or genetic metrics for conservation, they're mostly referring to things like the number of seeds in seed banks, the number of threatened breeds or varieties, uh, extinction uh, threat metrics, uh, patents, and things like that, rather than what we talk about in terms of genetic statistics. And then there's genetic data. So what I'm going to tell you is there's actually very few species that have conservation-relevant genetic data. 
Two really nice studies over the past few years have compiled genetic statistics from thousands of publications. And um, what you can see here in these numbers is there's a few hundred species in the Americas with you know, population genetic data that's been produced. By my calculations, it's about 5% of species in these regions. However, when we look to um, individual countries, especially in Latin America, the number of species that have genetic data sets, Brazil being the one that has the most, even in that case, it's only about 0.4% of all species, vertebrate and plant species, uh, not even considering invertebrates, have any DNA data that's been produced at all. Similar numbers in the United Kingdom and Cameroon. Um, my colleague Michael Bruford had, had started to compile these uh, numbers, so 2% and 0.3% for these two countries of plant species had had any genetic study done on them. And then there's even skepticism about whether genetic data sets are useful, even if we do have them. Um, this uh, commentary in 2016 proposed that as few as 4% of genetic studies actually result in some applied outcome. So to summarize, uh, there's a moderate use of genetic data for high profile, highly funded species and managing them. Uh, there's very little consideration or understanding of genetic issues, genetic concepts, genetic statistics by policymakers. And in my opinion, there's very little, very few species that have any genetic data available um, in terms of it being sampled well enough across the species range and sampled in a way that informs conservation, my guess would be greater than 99.9% .9 of species don't have that kind of genetic data available to inform conservation action. Even if we do have genetic data, there's also well-known barriers. A uh, few publications listed here about the barriers in trying to communicate genetic data to non-geneticists. So in my opinion, in spite of the genomics revolution, the use of DNA data in conservation is a slow and still very expensive and, and time consuming process. So I've been thinking the past few years about how can we assess genetic status of species and conserve their genetic diversity without actually having any DNA data. I propose that we return to the basic concepts in population genetics, that very small populations have high genetic drift and low ability to respond to natural selection and the basic principle that among populations you see genetic differences due to either isolation by distance, isolation by environment, or biogeographic history. And that we can use this knowledge and the knowledge of demography and, and geography to conserve species genetic diversity without DNA data. Um, this was proposed by several colleagues in the room uh, more, uh, about 20 years ago that we can do genetic conservation without genetic data. Um, why would we do this? So, uh, like I said, there's very few species with genetic data available. If we can use non-genetic data, I think we can um, scale up to a huge degree by even orders of magnitude the number of species that we can do genetic conservation for. If we can do that, if we can assess the genetic status of many, many species, we can then prioritize among those species and populations which need genetic conservation effort, set quantitative targets for improving genetic status, show change over time, and I think also very importantly, connect genetic concerns and issues to people who are non-geneticists like the public and policymakers. I'm gonna talk about three things. Uh, my work on genetic indicators for the Convention on Biological Diversity my work on ecogeographic measures of safeguarding genetic diversity in situ or ex situ, and my work with botanic gardens trying to provide advice about how do we uh, collect seed and conserve it in botanic gardens. So for the first of these, if we wanted to maintain genetic diversity of species, what are the basic principles we might think about? We would want to think about maintaining sufficiently large populations so that genetic drift does not have a dominant effect. We would want to prevent the loss, of course, of distinct populations, and when possible for those few species we can and have funding to monitor using DNA to inform particular management actions. So my colleagues and I, over the past three years, developed these three so-called indicators of genetic diversity and advocated and proposed and described them 
uh, to the Convention on Biological Diversity. And we actually attended the COP15 conference in December in Montreal, where countries of the world got together and committed to their next biodiversity commitments for the next decade. And we're really proud that two of the indicators that we developed and which I'll describe to you were recommended by the COP15 agreement and that 192 countries of the world are now committed to reporting on over the next decade. The first of those is relating to effective population size. You've already heard a little bit about this today. An NE of approximately 500 should prevent uh, rapid genetic diversity loss. So shown in this diagram, once you get below that threshold, genetic diversity loss rapidly accelerates over time. Populations also have relatively less ability to respond to natural selection. The concept of effective size has already been used for decades in forestry, fisheries, and other sectors. And so it's actually also an accessible concept to those who don't have population genetic training but may work in these sectors. Effective size is also increasingly used uh, under the US Endangered Species Act and the European Union Habitats Directive as a measure of whether populations are currently resilient and what is the reference population size that those populations should be restored to. And for example, has been mentioned in under restoration of the white bark pine as well. So the second indicator is about not losing distinct populations. This is fairly straightforward. Um, we want to maintain genetic adaptations to different locations. And this is also one that can be easily explained to the public because even the public can see things like different phenology at different times of the year, um, migration, things like that, uh, how species in, in different populations can respond differently. And then lastly, again, I'm very skeptical about how many species we have DNA for, but for certain high priority species, if we get DNA data, we can inform things like translocations and ecological restoration. So um, how would we calculate these indicators? We need two things. We need to know where populations are now and, and where they were in the past, and we need some estimate of effective size. And I'm gonna propose that we use uh, census size as a proxy for effective size. My colleagues and I have um, looked back at several past meta-analyses and gotten together as much data as we can, and most NE over NC ratios are between 0.1 and 0.3. So for most species, we can use an NE over NC ratio of about 0.1 to translate census size to effective size. So where do we get this data? This is the crux of these indicators. Um, instead of using genetic data, my colleagues and I have proposed that we get data from as many sources as possible. This could be forest inventories, plant inventories, uh, management reports, threat assessments, cons consultation with local or expert knowledge holders, um, citizen science, uh, and other methods. And now I'll show you some examples. The first species I worked with on this project was a western uh, plant species called Maguire daisy. Data were obtained from uh, management reports, uh, recovery plans actually through the Endangered Species Act. Um, and we can see here the actual estimates of, of counts for each of the populations. And from this, we can get the number of populations exceeding our NC threshold and calculate the indicator relating to effective size and populations maintained. This Mexican mountain juniper doesn't have any formal scientific studies or reports on it. So my colleagues uh, consulted with local botanists, park rangers, citizen scientists who had published photos on iNaturalist um, to get rough estimates of hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands, how many plants existed in a given location. And again, we could calculate the indicator from that Populations lost were identified using uh, both consultation with the experts as well as looking at Google Maps to see um, eradication of habitat. Another method is to use more formal systematic surveys that are performed at the national level. Here in Japan, there's um, a national botanical society that has performed repeated surveys over decades of some of the rare plants. So for this species, that was our, our data source uh, there weren't exact counts, but we plants were put into bins of 100 to 500, 500 to 1,000, et cetera. And so again, from that, we can get rough estimates of census size and thus effective size. 
Last example I want to point out, um, we can do the same procedure, get an estimate of the number of populations above our threshold. If we assume the N over NC ratio of 0.1, if we change our assumption and we use a different N over NC ratio, you can see that the number of populations exceeding the threshold changes, and thus the indicator value changes. I think this is actually an advantage because when reporting conservation status of species, we do want some reflection of uncertainty. So for all of this work, we're going to iterate over different assumptions of N over NC as well as different assumptions of what population boundaries are and any other uncertainty there might be. What we can then do is um, make a list of all the species, the indicator values. A country could report the mean indicator value of their species and then see how that changes over time. But can we do that at fairly large scale? So our goal and what we've been doing uh, in collaboration with nine countries around the world. Importantly, in collaboration with scientists working at the national biodiversity, biodiversity agencies, not just university scientists, but scientists who would be involved in eventual decision making and reporting, uh, we are analyzing 100 species per country for these indicators, again, using non-genetic data. I will report just very brief results of our efforts within the United States looking at species uh, either listed or proposed for listing under the U.S. Endangered Species Act. It's a fairly systematic way of reporting on them. These are long reports. They can be 50, 100, 200 pages long. But by reading these reports, we can extract this NE, over N, this NE data and the population's maintained data. So first, the optimistic uh, result is that a fairly small number of historical populations have been lost for these about 150 species that we've looked at, although they're about a third of the species we can't get, uh, we don't have sufficient confidence to, to actually calculate. Uh, but a fairly not small number, a, a little over 10% of historical populations are lost. But the uh, pessimistic finding is very few populations per species exceed the threshold of NE500. So the median proportion of populations above the NC5000 is about 9%. So what we have shown is that we can collect non-genetic data to estimate the genetic status of species for hundreds of species, and it has highlighted the critical status, uh, the critical result that the vast majority of these species have most of their populations with very low NE and are in danger or are already losing genetic diversity. Um, so I think this is a really cool opportunity, again, to assess genetic status in a fairly standardized way without using genetic data. It is a fairly time consuming, um, two to six hours per species to go through all the available data sources or consult experts, but that's order of magnitude faster than doing a genetic study. The second thing I want to talk about is uh, a different approach, an ecogeographic approach. That first part of the talk was about the genetic status of species and how threatened their populations are to genetic processes. This part is about how protected is the species range. So how much of the species range has been sampled from and kept in a seed bank or botanic garden, and how much of the species range has been protected by protected areas. Again, this builds on these basic genetic concepts of increased genetic differences with isolation by environment, isolation by distance, or biogeographic processes. Um, and so we're gonna use this to approximate genetic diversity conserved. I'll show you an example talking about ex situ conservation. This species, uh, Georgia oak, uh, southeastern US, the white circles represent occurrence points where the species uh, has been recorded to occur. The black points represent places that it occurs where seed has been sampled and is currently growing as plants in botanic gardens. So that's about 29% of that white area has been covered by those black circles. We can also look at eco ecological coverage. So by counting the number of EPA ecoregions the species has been sampled from versus the number it occurs in, and that's a little bit higher number, it's about 41% ecological coverage. How do we do this? Well, we need two things. We need a data set of wild occurrences 
which we can get from places like GBIF, the US Forest Inventory Analysis, iNaturalist, um, BONAP, which is a county level occurrence database, and other uh, similar databases. We then need a database of the conservation effort. So we can get that from BGCI's, Botanic Garden Conservation International's Plant Search, which is a database of thousands of botanic gardens globally and what species are protected in those gardens. Many of those have uh, geo-reference points of where the seed was sampled. Uh, we can also use protected area databases to look at in situ protection. So in either case, we're gonna take that second data set and overlay it on the first data set to get, again, our percent of coverage of the species range. And this is work mostly done by Emily Beckman Bruns at the Morton Arboretum, and parallel efforts were done by Colin Cowrie and Dan Carver, um, and I'll tell you a little bit about both of their work. What differs, uh, this approach differs from that first approach in that it's highly automatable. Once you have those data sets and they're cleaned, which is not an easy process, but once they're the data sets are cleaned and verified, you can scale this up to tens, hundreds, thousands of species. So these are a few examples of oaks in the United States that we've done this for. Once we do this across dozens of species, we can then bin species into those that really need a lot of conservation effort, those over here, and those for which most of their geographic range has been conserved over there. So this prioritizes the species we need to do seed collections for. We've done this uh, beyond oaks, so for walnuts, pines, laurels, yews, beech, hickory, and a few others. Um, and just looking at these graphs, you can see that there are some species that have most of their range conserved and some species with very few of their range conserved. So why is that? Very interested in why we have more successfully conserved some species than others. It's not due to the species economic use. And this is very preliminary. It's, you know, with a few um, hundred species, uh, some of those that have, are, are kind of biased in how we chose them. But from what I can tell, the, this is the coverage, the conservation success, basically. And then it's not related to economic use, the continent of origin, the seed um, uh, storage mechanism, orthodox or not, uh, or to the number of gardens or plants conserved in gardens, as you might guess, the um, degree to which we have conserved species geographic ranges is highly related to the size of the geographic range. It's much harder to conserve fully the geographic range of large range species. So on the one hand, this is really good. Our rarest and smallest range species are really well conserved in, in gardens uh, and by protected areas, but um, those really large range species, very little of their geographic ecological range and thus genetic diversity have been conserved. Uh, again, Colin Cowrie and Dan, Dan Carver have actually been working on this for years before we started working at, on it at the Morton Arboretum. Uh, for over a decade they've been doing this, uh, especially for crop wild relatives and have now scaled this up to thousands of crop wild relatives globally. Just looking at the US, their results show that almost all of our crop wild relatives have insufficient conservation status in terms of protecting their genetic diversity. Something like 90% of them have less than 50% of their geographic range conserved, either ex situ or in situ, and about two thirds of them have less than 25% of their geographic range conserved. So that's a lot of genetic diversity of these vital species, not only ecologically, but also that we rely on for human society, are not protected. On the other hand, um, so Sally did this work, Sally and colleagues did this work in British Columbia, a similar approach, and most of the tree species in British Columbia have a fairly good um, ex situ and in situ conservation status with respect to their genetic diversity using pretty similar non-genetic, non-DNA based metrics. Another cool thing we can do with this approach is we can track change over time. So these are more recent seed collections after the initial analysis was done. These are new seed collections and how the geographic coverage of this Georgia oak has been increased over time. And thanks to the American Public Gardens Association and US Forest Service who are funding these amazing seed collections of rare trees throughout the US and they are using our method to help justify where those seed collections should take place. I've also done this with uh, Quercus savardii, a desert adapted oak, um, and you can see it 
it is quite difficult to fully cover. The ge this was a, a several week long expedition and still there's a lot of the geographic range we have not conserved, but we did a good job and we boosted uh, from only one population to, to many populations that have now been conserved. So in this uh, second part of the talk, I hope, hope I've shown you that this eco-geographic approach is very scalable and it allows prioritizing among those species that really need conservation effort to conserve their genetic diversity, it helps with planning where to sample and tracking improvements as we sample more places. And it helps communicate to leadership. So to both the garden leadership, to leadership of NGOs or government organizations, and to people who are funding this work in a pretty simple way with maps and, and these nice bar charts about advances in genetic conservation. Okay, and then lastly I wanna talk about using simulations to guide uh, the work of botanic gardens in their ex situ conservation. So botanic gardens, uh, we do a lot of seed sampling and, and growing seeds up and, and safeguarding those plants ex situ. But we often wonder, well, how much do we need to protect? What's the minimum size we, of you know, populations we need to keep ex situ? And I'm going to talk about how we can use simulations to answer that. I was very inspired uh, about 12 years ago reading this publication, which came out in the 1970s, so almost 50 years ago. And it was reflecting on how we are losing our agricultural biodiversity due to homogenization of our food systems, industrialization, loss of habitat, and we need to get more stuff in seed banks. And it was saying, well, of course, seed banks are limited in their size. We only have so many curators. We have to also characterize and use all this genetic resources, so we have to optimize how we sample it. They used pretty simple pop gen theory to predict minimum numbers of samples. Um, other people built on that and sort of expanded how can we use that for more rare versus more common species. And my work picked up on the fact that their basic recommendations were kind of assuming every species is alike and every species conforms to really simple uh, pop gen predictions about allele frequencies, et cetera. Trees differ, uh, plants differ in their dispersal mechanism, pollinators, their size, their longevity, their geographic distribution and commonness. So I developed an approach based on simulations where we can simulate all of these different characteristics, get a computational simulated data set representing the species in the real world and then sample from that and see how well sampling strategies perform. So how does that work? Um, we, get, uh, we can take the species geographic range, we can create a relatively simplified model approximating you know, the number of populations and how big they are and how far apart they are, simulate a data set that represents the entire species, so we have a simulated genetic data set of thousands or hundreds of thousands of plants, and then try out different sampling strategies, which looks like this. We can sample from one to any number of plants with actually different spatial strategies if you want. Um, and for every sample, you calculate how much genetic diversity, in this case, in terms of unique alleles, is captured uh, or conserved in your sample. So in one project, we did this for you know, species you can see that differ in their commonness and geographic range and isolation. So for 14 threatened oaks of the US, and this was almost all work done by Keely Rosenberger, a, a research experience for undergraduate student in our lab, who's now um, at CU Boulder as a PhD student. She did this for 14 different species, simulating each of their ranges, and you can see where this accumulation curve of alleles crosses some arbitrary threshold of 95%, and it varies by species. So there are different minimum size thresholds for each species and it ranges from 75 to well over 500. But for most of the oak species, it was between two and 400. So this provides precise, precise advice for each of these species, but also a general guidance for threatened oaks in general. Uh, downside to simulations, they are dependent on the assumptions you put into the model. So for every species we repeated the simulation with, a major assumption changed about whether there was a bottleneck or not, or how many populations there were, or how different those populations were. And for a few of the species, you can see that these lines move, but most of them don't. So our results were actually pretty robust to the assumptions of the simulations. 
I also did this uh, during one of my postdocs uh, for a much more common species, European ash, um, built a model using over a thousand populations across uh, a fairly large geographic range of the UK, uh, millions of trees in the simulation, as well as smaller scale simulations um, within each population. And there's a lot of results in that paper. It's, it's a really cool paper. It's a little cut off there at the bottom, but um, it's one of my favorite papers because it was really practical advice that we wanted to give to seed collectors. And one of the things we found was, what's a good stopping point? So you could, you could collect thousands, you could collect millions of seed, and actually they have collected over two million seed of this species. Um, by looking at the tangent to these accumulation curves, you can see where that tangent gets really close to zero, a flat line, um, and we call that you know, getting close to the optimal stopping point. And for this species, it's about 30 populations and 30 trees per population, which was pretty close to what the foresters off the top of their head had said, well, 50 populations and 15 trees per population sounds pretty good. So our work that... Um, took a, a years of, of work developing these models was actually pretty close to what the foresters had originally predicted, which was pretty cool. Um, we've done other simulations of different types of uh, reproductive biology, different size populations, uh, the constraints of sampling in the real world where some trees produce more seed than others, um, and, and you can read more about our, our other work if you want. But I hope I've shown you that simulations are a cool complement to real DNA-based studies. They can estimate how much genetic diversity is conserved, as well as provide guidance, both in general to many species, but also tailored to each specific species, including very common species. So in the future, um, for each of these areas, I'll mention just one point. For that first section about uh, indicators for the conventional biological diversity, we developed them for global policy, but I think they actually have a lot of usefulness under endangered species legislation at the national level, including in the US and Canada, because um, for years we've struggled to say, well, are the status of these species improving? Because it's measured mostly by are they delisted or not? By looking at a more finer scale at populations, we can see are they improving their status, again, without using DNA data. Um, I think it's really important to test how each of these metrics, especially those ecogeographic metrics, correlate to real genetic data, and we're still in the process of testing that using large genomic data sets. And then lastly, I'm really excited for a future in which simulations are used by more scientists, um, and I think there's a lot of potential to make either the simulations or the functions that we built more accessible and more usable, so a lot of people are doing simulations to test sampling strategies. I want to close by mentioning that non-academic outputs are vital. Non-academic outputs are really vital if you want your research uh, to go into um, conservation or management impacts or policy impacts. We've spent a lot of time over the past five years making policy briefs, so simple one or two page, highly digestible, read in five minutes, non-technical language summaries, which should have key findings and recommendations in a small number of bullet points. We've also found that to work globally, they really need to be translated into many non-English languages. So some of our outputs we've translated into more than a dozen languages through our many international collaborators. It's also really important to work with NGOs. So in this case, this was the Center for Plant Conservation producing best practice guidelines. Really important to host webinars. Not everyone can attend in-person meetings, but webinars, again, ideally with translations, um, are a nice way that policymakers can interact and see your work and ask you questions. But at some point, it's also important to attend in person, not the scientific meetings, but to go to the forums where policymakers or managers are meeting and discuss with them in person. And we put some effort into that over the past few years, including at the CBD COP15. And it's important to have a lot of organizations on board behind your recommendations. So for our work for COP15, we had over 40 national and global NGOs and other institutions kind of signed on, agreeing to put their logo behind our recommendations. So take home, I hope I've shown that we can, one, estimate effective size and populations maintained using non-genetic data in order to assess species 
genetic status. We can estimate the ecogeographic coverage of protected areas and seed sampling. And we can use simulations to provide sampling advice to botanic gardens. And uh, all of this helps prioritizing, planning actions, measuring progress, and again, connecting genetic issues to non-geneticists. And um, just want to say again, a lot more work beyond the academic realm is needed if you want to put this kind of work into action. I'd say I spend about 10 to 20% of my time just on this sort of dissemination, policy briefs, webinars, attending uh, policy meetings, et cetera. Um, but it's feasible, and our work through COP15, which I think was really, um, really impactful, shows that it can work. Thanks. Thank you, Sean, for that wonderful and perfectly timed talk. So we do now have time for questions. Yes? Thank you, that was, that was a really well done presentation. How do you manage seed viability and germination from a, a timeline standpoint? Obviously, the seed isn't going to last forever, right? Uh, yes. I'm not as much of an expert in seed storage. Uh, my colleagues have worked a lot on that, and the Morton Arboretum has produced some really useful guidance on the different types of orthodox seed, the different barriers to seed storage. Uh, Emily Beckman Bruns, who I mentioned, has done some great work on that. Um, so I, I don't have a lot to say in, in terms of, like, how we manage that, other than it's important to provide it guidance on getting the right timing of when the seed is, is viable. I've been on seed collection trips where we've you know, missed the window of opportunity where the seed is at perfect maturity by a few days or a few weeks. Um, and that really impacts you know, how much of that seed can actually be used for conservation. So that's, that's probably all I can say about that. Um, maybe, maybe we can talk more about it. Uh, the other thing, I think it's important to build estimates of germination rate or viability into your predictive models. So when I say, you know, we need 500 samples of a given threatened species, that's 500 samples that are, you know, definitely viable seed that is, is going to survive. So if you know your, your germination rate is like 10%, then of course you need to collect 5,000 seed. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm just curious in terms of the sampling that you were talking about that includes all of those small fragment populations. So there's a chance that those are highly inbred, that they may not be locally adaptive, and that you're not actually gaining much um, by conserving them. I understand your approach is conservative, just in case there is important adaptive variation in those populations, but is there kind of a good enough threshold where you don't have to sample every fragment? Uh I think we could use similar principles that I talked about in terms of effective size and knowledge of how long those populations have been isolated. If they have like just been isolated in the most recent generation, they won't have had several generations of inbreeding, and so their you know, genetic uh, material would still represent the original population. But if you have those that maybe have 10 trees and they've been you know, through several, round, several generations of reproduction, then I think you could use simple rules like that to maybe say certain populations are not going to be appropriate to sample from. Hi. Thanks. Uh, your ratio of uh, NC to NE of 0 0.1, like uh, that graph that you showed had quite a bit of variation in it. And I was wondering, um, are there like aspects of life history or things about the, of, of a species life history that you could potentially use to guide tweaking that ratio for, for different organisms? Well, I didn't plant this question, but <laughs> I'm really glad you asked <laughs> because I was hoping someone would ask that. Uh, this is broken down by taxonomic group, and you can see that really it's only fish species, in particular bony marine fishes, that have really extreme any over NC ratios. And almost every other taxonomic, basically every other taxonomic group, including all the plants we've looked at, are, are above that, so the dotted line is the 0 0.1 threshold. So um, that explains the variation in the, the tail of that distribution. 
Oh, thanks very much, Sean. Great talk. And, and I agree with you totally that we can't wait for genetic data to uh, improve conservation of all those species out there. I am curious what you see as the, the questions facing genetic conservation that we, sh we sh can and should be using genetic data to get uh, sort of a, a better idea of how to keep improving uh, practices for case studies or, or that sort of thing. So where can we learn from uh, genetic data on top of this? Sure. Um, I think genetic data is useful for, um, one, for defining populations, so where population boundaries are, including long biogeographic barriers between populations where you've definitely had populations isolated for thousands or even millions of years, uh, which can sometimes only be revealed with genetic data. Uh, hybridization is a big one. Uh, that can often only be revealed with uh, genetic data and is not represented in the, the, the approaches I talked about today. Uh, myself, I'm pretty skeptical of the, you know, identifying alleles uh, under selection using, using the GEA type approaches. I think we still have a long way to go to proving that that's operational and, and useful for, um, for most species, anyways. Uh, so I would say biogeography uh, in terms of population delimitation and, and hybridization are two of the most important. And then, of course, um, analyzing our ex situ populations where we don't know much about the origin of the material to, to look at things like effective size or to look at uh, things like heterozygosity in, in zoo populations or botanic garden populations. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, Sean. Um, as a token of our appreciation for coming all the way to Canada and for sharing such great uh, genetic conservation. We do have a gift for you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. OK, it's me again. Uh, before we break up into concurrent sessions for our last session of the day, I just have a few very important announcements. First of all, the um, North American Forest Genetics Society it will be organizing and hosting a conference like this next year, but in Mexico, much warmer and uh, more beaches. So um, Brian Baltunas has told me that there are poster, or little posters um, put up in each of the ballrooms. So when you have a chance, please just go over there, check them out. There's a little QR code that you can scan to get you to um, to a survey that you can help to inform what that conference might be like. So take a second and have a look at that. Uh, okay, so for tonight, we're on track to finish finishing our next session a little bit after five. We need everybody to be outside the front of the hotel at 545 loading buses to go to the banquet tonight. So you don't have a lot of time, but hopefully a little bit of time to rest before we jump on those buses. So 545. Be ready out front of this hotel. We have two big, nice air-conditioned buses ready to transport you up there. Uh, some people asked if they can drive themselves. We encourage you to take the bus, but if you do want to drive yourself, there is the correct address. <laughs> so you can navigate to that or follow the buses up, which would probably be your best bet, and, uh, and then hopefully find your way back down here after. Um, OK, and now tomorrow is our field tour. Ah, I forgot about the drinks, the most important thing. Okay, so tonight, <laughs> uh, there will be wine on the table. There will be one drink ticket per person, which will get you a drink. After that, it's a cash bar. So if you do want to purchase anything other than wine, like beer or cider, make sure you have some cash on hand. It's $5 per drink, just to give you a warning before you get there, and then realize that you need to ask your friend for money. All right. Sorry, okay, so now for tomorrow. Tomorrow is our field tour. We've been watching the weather carefully. It's very unsettled. I think we're going to be okay, but make sure you're prepared for anything. We're going to be walking uh, on uneven ground at times, so make sure you have good footwear. I don't think sandals would be appropriate for this, but good running shoes or hiking boots would be good. Um, tall grass, too, so wear pants if you can. Uh, make sure you bring a hat, 
sunscreen, and extra water. It's very important because it does get very, I know it's freezing cold in here. Everyone's shivering, but it's 30 degrees outside right now, so it'll be warm. Uh, and uh, there is a chance of rain, so you might want to bring a sweater or, or a light jacket just in case. Um, it's a later start tomorrow because we know we're all going to have fun tonight at the conference, at the banquet. So uh, we need to be, again, outside the front of this hotel at 8.45 tomorrow morning loading buses. So if you're at a different hotel, make sure you come here. Be ready to go 8.45 tomorrow morning. Okay. Uh, Brian tells me that there's a breakfast buffet. The hotel here is, is providing a breakfast buffet for our group specifically. If you want a nice warm breakfast in the morning, you can go to the front desk, and it's 19 or $20 for a, a voucher. You have to prepay, and then you can come tomorrow morning and have a nice warm breakfast before the buses leave. Uh, what else do I got here? Now yeah, we'll have a nice lunch outside tomorrow. We've got a tent set up for, to keep us uh, out of the sun, but again, don't know what the weather's going to be like. I think we have everybody covered for their dietary restrictions, so I think we'll be okay there, too. Uh, and just a last little note about safety. If you feel uncomfortable walking around or being out in the heat tomorrow, don't feel bad about just letting us know. You can, you can always hang back and stay on the bus or something like that. We want everyone to be safe out there, and it can get pretty hot uh, out here in the Okanagan. So just be mindful of that. Don't feel bad. Okay. Yeah, so tomorrow we'll be splitting people into three groups. We want to keep our groups small so that each speaker is only speaking to just a small number of people, 30 or 40 rather than 100. So there's a little dot. There should be a dot on your name tag. Hopefully you have a dot. If not, we'll figure that out tomorrow. But that tells you which group you're in. So tomorrow will be very easy. We'll just split people up by the color of the dot on their name tag. So make sure you bring your name tag tomorrow or at least remember what group you're in. That's all. Okay. Um, Brian, anything else? Um, yeah, just one last little opportunity. If you missed, if your luggage haven't or hasn't arrived yet and you need to go to a store to buy some shoes, <laughs> then I'm, 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 I'm willing to take you there en route to the banquet tonight. So come and see me after, okay? And because uh, a few people have, have uh, had disruptions with their travels and we've had people just arrive late this afternoon. So, uh, um, understand that you know, maybe your luggage haven't arrived. So come and see me if you need a ride to the store to pick up something for tomorrow. Okay? And other than that, um, it is, as Nick says, we'll, don't be late for the bus. Dan Gadet is uh, really a real uh, taskmaster up there. He's got all of his crew, you know, with their, you know, their, their white spats and, and white tablecloths all ready for us. So we don't want to be late. There's going to be live music there. Um, I'm not sure how they're going to hand out the tickets, but uh, you'll get one. When you arrive and there's a craft beer and cider, they'll be sampling that, and then you can put your money down on what you like after. Um, it's going to be a great night. Um, I, the weather looks like it's going to hold. It's going to remain above 20 degrees until, until we're leaving there. So, but uh, you might want to bring something light. Um, but it, it's covered. Weather's going to be warm. We're going to have a great audience. We're going to have live music and good food, so uh, enjoy it. Okay, we'll see you up there. <laughs>